नमो नारायणाय हेलो डियर डिवोटीज ऑफ शिकागो कालीबारी टुडे अगेन वी आर कंटिन्यूइंग द लेक्चर ऑन द एसेंशियल्स ऑफ सनातन धर्म मे बी दिस विल बी द कंक्लूडिंग सेशन आई थिंक एंड लेट मी हैंड ओवर द माइक टू प्रोफेसर सुब्रमण्यम एंड मिसेस विद्या सुब्रमण्यम थैंक यू thank you namaskaram to all welcome to the session 6 which will be the concluding session in the series on the essentials of sanatana dharma as usual we'll start with our prayer om gajananam bhuta ganati sevitam kapita jambu balasara bhaktitam शंकराचार्य मध्यमा आचार्य पर्यता परंपरा नमस्कार from whom i learned to many things and to whom i owe a deep sense of gratitude the picture shows both of them together you may be able to identify sri chantaresh sekharendra saraswati popularly known as Mahapariva, who was the 68th Sankaracharya of the famous Kanchi Kamakoti Pitam, and on the right side you see the picture of Sri Santananda Swami Gal of Pudukkottai with folded hands and black beard. So these two were the inspiring. gurus and my guiding force throughout my life in fact i had the unique honor of receiving mahapariva with purna kumbham and santananda swami kal solemnized our marriage so these two great gurus have been a great force in my life and many of the things that i am talking to you today are those which i learned from them and i learned many things i'm sharing only a part of it with all of you so with that uh, humble namaskarams and a sense of gratitude we will quickly review the uh, previous sessions what did we learn in the previous session in the last lesson we learned about the role of faith and uh, number of saints who played a part in keeping this faith alive and that's the reason the sanatana dharma has stayed till today withstanding all the assaults it had over the last so many centuries these saints helped us to stay the sanatana dharma continue and and live and we also saw what are the purusharthas four of them it i mentioned dharmartha khava moksha and uh, we also talked about what are the samanya dharmas or ordinary dharmas which people need to follow those five of them i explained to you in detail 
It doesn't require any money to follow those dharmas. All it needs is a sense of conviction and a sense of faith in Sanatana Dharma. And we also talked a little bit about the pursuit of goals. And finally, the concept of Purusha with a little recitation of Purusha Suktam. So in today's uh, concluding session number six, we'll learn more about some of the distinctive features of Sanatana Dharma. It is all a part of what we all should know. How much of it to put it in praxis is entirely your decision. All I am placing before you is certain information about Sanatana Dharma, essential features of it. And it's up to an individual to follow it to the extent possible. I did mention in an earlier lesson that Sanatana Dharma focuses on you and the development is resting entirely on your own shoulders. Having said that, I'd like to today touch upon Dharma and Karma. There are two terms that are used very often in Sanatana Dharma itself is part of Sanatana Dharma. And Dharma has many meanings, but uh, important among them is the right conduct to one's assigned duty in life. It also implies the virtuous way one chooses to live one's life based upon those truths. In contrast, karma refers to the actions that one does. The word karma comes from the Sanskrit true kr, which means to act, to do. Even in Hindi, we say kam karna hai, isn't it? So this karna is something related to activity. So whatever karma or duty is assigned, doing it sincerely with total dedication is called dharma. The performer is the one who does the karma or karta as they called. And so dharma and karma are interrelated. If you do karma sincerely, it also follows dharma and, and dharma also guides you on how to do the karma. It's kind of a cycle. There are many unique features in our religion which are not really found in uh, many other religions. One of them is called the karma theory. What is karma theory? Uh, as you all know, in physics, we say any action has an opposite reaction, Newton's law. Now, this exists as an unavoidable rule in physics cause and effect, as it's called, action and reaction. And our ancestors have applied the same principle in, as in physics, the karma theory to human life. So every karma or action of man should have a resultant reaction which follows the karma theory. So if a person does a bad deed or a what is called papa, sinful, he has to suffer for it while the punya, the good deed, gets him a reward. It is uh, something which is easy to understand. Simply stated, it means thou shall reap what you sow. If you sow good seeds, you'll get good crops. So modern people, you know, they want uh, proof for every theory and uh, I'd like to illustrate this with an example of uh, Kanchi Mahapiri or how he actually showed a proof to a, a white woman who visited him in Kanchipuram. Uh, she wanted a proof of this reincarnation theory of how karma results in good deeds or bad deeds or bad effect of karma, how dharma and karma is kind of 
related. The effects of karma are to be seen and proved. So Mahaparivā asked her to go to a nearby maternity hospital and check the details of the babies born there on the day, what type of babies are born. And uh, she brought notes along with her and uh, she said one baby was very chubby, the other one was lean, one was very beautiful, fair, another one was black, and one was uh, born in a very luxurious ward, maybe a rich person's wife, and one was uh, born in a common ward. So there were differences between the babies born on the same day, around the same time. So Mahapariva asked her, why do you think there is difference among these babies? Why should there be so many inequalities? And why should one be born in poverty, the other one is in prosperity? And why one, one should be healthy and the other one should be weak? And how is it that there is some differences like this? So she was not able to explain it, but Mahapajwa said, what reason can be attributed to the inequalities is none other than the karma theory. Once our present lease of life is decided depending upon our actions or karma during the previous birth, it results in the next birth. So she, uh, she accepted that explanation but this explanation may not be really enough for today's modern people in the digital world. They will ask for scientific proof. Now, there are many people who do uh, research in parapsychology and uh, many of them have come up with uh, very miraculous uh, observations of uh, people recalling their previous birth you know, the places where they have not been before, but they are able to recall them precisely and instances recalled precisely, places recalled. And there's so many people who can recollect things that they had experienced in their previous birth in faraway places which they had not visited. Now that is something, you know, there is research is still going on in this and there have been many cases like this where people have recalled the previous birth. So I think that is a kind of best proof one can give on the karma or reincarnation theory that people are born and uh, once the present life is over, they take rebirth in another. So it is the firm belief of Hindus that the balance sheet of punyam and papam the good deeds and the bad deeds they make, that decides the quality of their lives, maybe in this birth or even in the next birth. So that is uh, the karma theory. And how to do dharma and karma, the choice is entirely depending upon you. Going further, in the last session, we talked about uh, the four human goals called uh, Purushartha. I mentioned it in detail. Uh, let's take the first three goals, Dharma, Artha, Kama, which comes on the Veda Purva Bhagam. I couldn't say the, the earlier part. The first three pursued Veda Purva Bhagam. And uh, look at what typically people pursue as their goals. One thing is definite that people pursue different goals. Some want to be engineers, some doctors, and some want to do something outstanding, like stand, setting a record in Olympic games and uh, earn a place in Guinness Book of Records. Uh, a few days back, I heard that in Pune, the city where I was raised, there was a contest to eat 10 pounds of food in a very short time and the winner would get a Royal Enfield motorbike. 
So for some, the goal would be to win that motorcycle. So these goals are different and they keep changing as you grow. And uh, artha becomes the first goal for people. That is everyone's basic need is food and clothing. So they would like to earn money and pursue a goal to live and to have the basic needs fulfilled. And the next step would be it, of course, enjoy some life uh, with karma, uh, pleasures, visit to exotic places, uh, dinners and fancy restaurants, and maybe uh, yeah, vacation in Hawaii or some resort. You know, these are many, many things which are part of the Artha Kama. And none of these is refuted by Sanatana Dharma. It doesn't prevent you from uh, uh, enjoying life and pursuing Artha and Kama. In fact, it's all part of it. All it says is that the karma, action, what you do, should adhere to dharma. Now, why should we really adhere to dharma? Why can't somebody eat, drink, and be merry? Because, as I said earlier, Hindus believe that dharma results in good karma and vice versa. A punyam, for which there is no exact equivalent word in English, you can say, Bad karma, that's all you can say. It's uh, the opposite of, you can say, the bad karma, you can say, as uh, a papa, which is called sin, but punya, there is no equivalent. There is no equivalent word in English. So the idea of sin or papam is based on morality and justice at one level. Just as in Christianity, you say, do unto others as you would like to be done unto yourself. This is the base for morality, whatever may be your religion. Now, many of us are doing many types of papas or sins, we can say, by body, speech, mind and body, and with money too, by body, many sinful activities like including stealing, beating, killing, drugs, and so on, and uh, also by mouth, uh, speaking untruth, lies language, spreading gossip, these are all sins. And by mind, we think and uh, play and plan many sinful activities, including destruction. And as we all know, there is no end to these wrong things. And because of these, we should at least learn and practice doing punya. Hinduism believes that if one performs good karma or punyam, it will be useful to get good rewards in this life or better life in the next birth, if not now. So another key feature is that Hinduism is believing in reincarnation, rebirth after death. So the individual who thinks of himself as a separate entity, he goes through many transformations till realization. The body is just like a dress and you add this as long as you're life is there, then this dress is thrown out, the body is thrown out, and then you get into another dress or another birth. So this is the level of deep understanding that the soul or Atman, that is never dead, it is only the body which is dead. So it only gets a new outer form. So whatever uh, we reap, we have these good deeds, but it doesn't still seem to satisfy because this is only temporary. All people are looking for is a long term or what you call eternal bliss. Many launch their spiritual pursuits late in life after a materialistic career. And we need to have a harmonious blend of our pursuits. It doesn't mean that you should wait until you are retired. You can do spiritual pursuits while you are working. It's uh, like flying with two wings. One is a spiritual wing, the other one is a material wing. But you should take care that you don't flap either of them too hard because then you will end up just circling around. It has to be a harmonious blend of pursuit and a gentle flying or gentle flapping of both these wings so that you get 
a nice path of flight. So coming to the, the fourth pursuit, we talked about the first three pursuits. The last pursuit is moksha. You know, what is moksha? It is actually derived from the verb muk. Muk is to release, to get free. It means mukti or release from the world of samsara, the world of daily living. Now, how to attain it? There is one part of Vedanta which shows the way, and that is the end part of Veda. It is called Vedanta. Anta means yen. So, it is referring mostly to the Upanishads, which were elaborations of the Vedas, and it is very highly philosophical and uh, may be a kind of dry subject for a common man. So, Sanatana Dharma provides this Vedanta where it says it is possible to attain mukti or self-realization and that too in this life itself. So there are many people who attain this kind of mukti in their own life, but not all of them were uh, sannyasis or monks. Many were married and led lives, ordinary lives like ours, which a typical family man does. And uh, I'd like to give you one example here. There were many, of course, uh, there was, uh, uh, I could give you any number of names, but then I'd like to pick on one who was called Purandara Dasa. He was actually a jeweler, a rich jeweler, was called Navakoti Nayaka. The original name was Srinivasa Nayaka. He was a jeweler to the king in Mysore. And then one day something happened. It changed, transformed his life. All of a sudden he attained that realization. There is no point in having this kind of life. So he changed over and then he became a devotee of Lord and sang and made so many compositions in Kannada. Over 400,000, maybe more than that, but then only about 700 or so are now available. So I'd like uh, Vidya to sing one song from his composition of the great Purandara Dasa, who is considered the father of Carnatic music. Today his name lives and he was there in the 16th century. Even after five centuries, his name and his composition live on. So that was his greatness. Okay. Kali Yuga Dali Hari Nama Bane Dare Kula Ko Di Hedu Dari Suva Vo Ranga Kali Yuga Dali Hari Mamma, when I 
What a beautiful composition. It is actually the gist of Sanatana Dharma put in just a couple of lines. You know, in a nutshell, I'll tell you the meaning of this. He says, in Kali Yuga, if one just remembers Hari's name, his whole lineage will get the benefit. You know, in Kali Yuga, Nama Sankirtanam is what is recommended because today, most of us are not in a position to do yajnas, the sacrifices and do the rituals with all this digital world today happening, particularly in pandemic, when temples are closed also, priests are not available. In such a situation, what else you do? At least we can sing the names of Lord. So in Thali Yuga, this is recommended. And for attaining easy mukti or salvation, this Sulabhaga Mukti ke, in easy way. That's why I made my website as Easy Hinduism. It is easy. It is easy salvation. Oh, mind, manase. Jalaruga Nabane. It is easy to name, remember the names of Padmanabha. Archana. I don't know Archana. I don't know how to praise. Don't say these and lower yourself. Just pray to Achuda, Achuda Nanda Govinda Mukundana. It says, just pray to Achuda Mukunda. Itcha inde ne nena manave with your heart. With your heart, you just pray to Achuda Govinda Mukunda. All nice names. You don't have to pay anything for that. You say, Jabba I don't know how to meditate. I don't know how to do any penance or meditation. Don't think you have not received any upadesham. Upadesham will be veda. Don't think. Oh, mind. This is apara mahima. The super power of Sri Purandara Vittala, who is well known. You know, Pandarpur's deity is called Vittala. And Vittala is one known for bestowing all kinds of Apara Mahima, innumerable boons. So that is a gist. So it's very simple, you know. It is something which one can follow without really investing money. All you need is with your heart. So having said that, let's go a little further on this. Uh, I can, as I said, I give you more examples. Buddha. Buddha was married and he attained Nirvana or self-realization under a tree. Likewise, Saint Tagaraja, he was also a married man. Rama Bhakti, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa was also married. He attained realization in his own lifetime. And today, we are enjoying the benefits of that great person, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who built a mission, who built so many of these the schools and colleges and ashramams. And today, his disciple Vivekananda came to Chicago. As a result, we have many temples, the Kali Bari temple. And similar things have happened in, in this country. So it is uh, not that uh, 
one has to be really a sannyasi. Many of the Nayanars and Alvars I mentioned, they were all married and led ordinary lives. They were not even qualified. Sant Tukaram, Namadev, and Maharashtra, they were all married people. All that requires is one has to follow the path of the heart, but the mind has to be controlled. So moksha is the highest of these purusharthas. It is like, say, getting a PhD. And you don't uh, jump uh, from uh, uh, grade one to PhD. You have to go through certain process and a certain uh, uh, level of education. So likewise, one has to be mature to realize uh, a moksha. And till we reach that stage of maturity, we have to go through the stages like uh, a bud, then blooming, and then you become unripe fruit, and then eventually you, you go to total ripeness, just as a flower becomes a fruit. The same way that you have to go through patiently and lead a harmonious life until your mind ripens. So that is a process. Of course, not everybody will get a PhD degree, but if you try hard, you might. So you have to prepare the mind gradually and how to evaluate and, and uh, uh, prepare your mind. That's a big question. So let's see how Sanatana Dharma classifies the qualities of mind in different categories. Now it classifies basically in three categories, three gunas as they called. The first quality is Sattva and Rajas and tamas and we have all these three qualities in us we have got a blend of it and whichever predominates determines your activities this is uh, a, a concept which comes from the sankhya philosophy and is a key understanding to vedanta it originates from a deep philosophy, and the three qualities shape and uh, influence all beings. They are all present in all living beings, but in different proportions. It is the proportion that determines the character and the qualities of that particular person. Let's understand what is sattva. Sattva is actually derived from the Sanskrit root sat, meaning pure awareness. Sattva reflects harmony, kind of poise. And it, uh, if it predominates in the mind, we feel peaceful, happy, at ease, and free of desire and fear. This state of mind which the yogis and munis uh, and uh, sannyasis, they seek uh, to get the spiritual liberation. And uh, that's uh, sattvic mind, as they call it. The second is called rajas. Whereas sattvic is kind of a reflective in nature, rajas is a, a projecting power. It's a dynamic mode of passion, action, extrovert, agitation. And uh, it is necessary to create action and make things happen. You'll find this in uh, uh, many people who are in sports or you are uh, uh, a top executives in corporations. It, uh, there is uh, a desire to excel and uh, the predominance of rajas in uh, the mind, of course, makes people restless and uh, they are gripped by uh, desires and fears and uh, uh, the need to be constantly busy and possibly prone to uh, anger and uh, uh, aggression. So that is a, a different type of quality. A certain degree of rajas is necessary to be healthy, but excessive is a source of great suffering. And lastly, tamas, which indicates the picture shows somebody just lying idle. You can see that. So it's a kind of a, uh, 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 an obscuring, wailing kind of power. It's uh, more indicated to dullness, rest and sleep, and then uh, lethargy and sloth that kind of quality. So uh, these are the three different qualities which are present in uh, all objects in various degrees. And one quality is always more present or dominant than the other. You can see that uh, uh, 
a person who wants to have a peace of mind would seek sattvic quality. So a person gets his attitude and behavior moderated by the preponderance of any of this guna. And therefore, the cultivation of sattvic mind should be a goal. You want to progress uh, into higher planes of uh, Purushartha. So this leads us to another key concept which is found in uh, Sanatana Dharma. And that concept is called Parmanashrama. You all must have uh, heard about this Parmanashrama. Uh, we talked about uh, Gunas. No, based on the interplay of these Gunas, the Vedic culture outlines a classification of society called Varnashrama that divided society into four groups or Varnas. Now, Varna literally means color. In the ancient times and even now, colors are used to classify. Now, you can see a traffic signals, red means to stop. Orange means to get ready and green means to go. So it's a color code. Likewise, in Yajurveda also, you have two distinct parts. One is called Krishna Yajurveda, other one is called Shukla Yajurveda, meaning black Yajurveda and white Yajurveda. So the classifications were made on the inherent qualities with corresponding obligations or duties for each Varna. Now, what is the, these four classifications? Now, they are called Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishya, and Sukra. Starting with Brahmins, basically it is a spiritual class, by nature, a Sattvic class, which included priests, teachers, educators, and these were people who were described as the intellectual class or white collar people as you call it. They went into sort professions, not physical labor, but then intellectual labor. So it is uh, a kind of a classification based on what kind of capabilities they had. And then comes Kshatriyas who were primarily the rulers, the kings, the defenders, the administrators, the predominance of Rajas Guna, with some Sattvic, of course. Rama was a great Kshatriya king. You will see the many examples of uh, Kshatriyas were rulers. And the third classification is Vaishya, which is uh, covering uh, the merchant class, the business people, the trade and commerce people who uh, also dealt with agriculture, marketing, uh, with an active uh, uh, mixture of uh, Rajas and Tamas uh, Gunas. And finally, uh, the Sudras, who are the service class, uh, mostly the unskilled labor class, which had uh, uh, more of Tamas and uh, Rajogunas. So each of these classification was not designed to degrade one against the other, they were all important, like parts of the body. You cannot say only my leg is important or my head is important, or my... all are important. It's like even Purushottam says, these all came from the parts of the body and each part of the body is important. So each Varna is important and they are not unequal in any way. Each has a role to play, like cogs in the wheel. So. The Shastras have laid down the uh, uh, responsibilities for each of these based on their own uh, capabilities. So system in which the duties were interlinked, that is the secret. They were all working together for years, centuries. And there was a harmonious way of working together. Each had an assigned work and they did it with dedication. 
if you see the temples which are built in India, they are all built by artisans. A Brahmin may worship, he may be a priest, but he cannot build the temple all by himself. It was somebody else. And the king had to provide the money and the finances to administer the construction of the temple. So the merchants had to do the business of getting all the stuff together, buying them. So the principle on which uh, the, the Vedic religion itself is founded is that a man must not live for himself, but he should serve the mankind. And with Varna Dharma in the true form, is a system according to which the collective welfare of the society was ensured. If you take a look at it deeply, impartially, you will realize that it is a unique system to bring about orderly and harmonious life. The people often mix this with jati, which is different. Jati is different to referring to caste. Jati comes from the root jana. Jana is birth. So it is relating to heredity skills. Like you have kumba, the potter. You have the uh, uh, cobbler, mochi. You have the achari who is doing the carpentry work, masonry work, goldsmith, and so on. They are all people. The weaver, for example, the silk saris which are woven in India, they are all done by a class of people who have inherited skills from centuries from their predecessors in the family. Even in America, I was at American Foundry Society meeting once and I met with the company and I came to know that they were in business of making castings for seven generations. And they wouldn't like to let know the grandfather hands it over to the father and father hands it over to the son. So it has been going on and they're experts in that field. So that is something. So each particular Varna classification is based on special capabilities and they have the obligation to do certain specific duties. So that is a unique concept here. Going further on this, there are also stages in life. It is also defined in Sanatana Dharma. There are basically four ashramas. And what is an ashrama? Ashrama is generally considered to be a, a place of spiritual shelter. Uh, each stage of life is not only a natural, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a part of a natural journey, should say from grave to, from cradle to grave, as they call it, cradle to grave. Now, each of these asramas also have specific duties. They are brahmacharya. Brahmacharya is one, it's a student life. In good old days, they had the gurukulam system where the, the youngsters were uh, trained by a guru. It's like a boarding school today. And uh, they were taught spiritual values, uh, memorization, skill development, character formation, where all the goals, so even sons of the royal families, they all learned under a guru. In the Brahmacharya Aspam, you see Rama, Lakshmana, even the Kauravas, they were all trained by their gurus in their warfare. So, the, the objective of this boy is to live a simple life free from any pleasures and material allurement and to serve the Guru, to hear and assimilate the Vedas and develop all the appropriate qualities to become a beautiful citizen. Humility, discipline, simplicity, purity of thought, cleanliness, soft-heartedness, all these qualities were developed during that Brahmacharya period. And once it is completed maybe 14 years or 16 years. They marry and enter the Grihastha Ashrama, which is a family. The Ashrama, it's a household life. Now, they have responsibilities as the head of a family. Responsibilities include wife, children, relatives, maybe parents, and even society. Society also has to be catered for by the Grasa, who is head of a household, and he 
makes money by working and he enjoys the pleasures. Arthakama both are permitted. He observes the religious rituals. He protects and nourishes all the family members. And he teaches his children spiritual values. And he also gives in charity, especially to feed poor people and take care of them. So that is uh, probably a long span of one's life of Grahasthasam until a person goes for retirement. And once he retires, he go, goes into another ashrama called Vanaprastha. Vana, Vanaprastha, it really means forest dweller. He goes to a forest, uh, not these days, but in good old days, they used to go and do uh, meditation. They retire from family responsibilities. And then they go on pilgrimage, uh, generally devote more time for spiritual pursuits, engage in penance, and do things which take them to the moksha. And finally, the ashrama is sannyasa, where a person renounces life as self say He doesn't do anything for himself. He doesn't cook. He doesn't do any rituals. He only is available to show services, teach other people, and is free to wander in spiritual pursuits. He goes from one place to another, keeps teaching people, the value of Sanatana Dharma. And he lives a life which is dependent on others. So he, somebody has to give him food. So that is describing the four stages of life. So now you've seen different aspects of Sanatana Dharma. We have covered it in fairly great detail within the available time. So now I would like to sum up what are the distinctive features so far we have learned some of these in a nutshell, I would say, distinctive features of Sanatana Dharma. As I mentioned in the very first class, there is no single founder. It's a nameless religion which was named Hinduism because of the foreigners who felt the need to recognize the people living beyond the river Indus, and they call Hindus, and from that it came Hinduism. And Vedas are considered the holy book and the authority of Sanatana Dharma. We covered it in detail, including a demonstration of Vedic chanting. And contrary to what many people think, Hinduism is monotheistic. It is Brahman. One truth and one reality, one God, but having different manifestations in different forms. You have many of them, hundreds of them. It's kind of unity in diversity. Even though there are so many of them, eventually it all refers to only one supreme almighty. So we've seen that. And then there is the theory of karma and rebirth, the reincarnation. It is not only for humans, but it is also for the God. We have so many avatarams of Lord Vishnu. And out of this, primarily, we talk about 10 avatarams, what called Dasha avataram. They are all the same God coming in different forms in reincarnation, appropriate to the particular yuga or particular time, where a certain danger has happened, they come to protect and give us a solution. So this is again unique in Sanatana Dharma, the theory of karma and, and, and rebirth. Then we talked about uh, the consequences of gunas, how the gunas influence the Varnashrama. We talked about the pursuit of goals, the Purusharthas, again a unique concept in Sanatana Dharma. And the Varnasrama based classification based on inborn uh, inherent capabilities with corresponding obligations. So there are these kind of distinctive features which Sanatana Dharma 
part of it. And finally, it says there are many paths to moksha, the final goal or salvation. It is not restricted to only one path. It is so open. I haven't seen a more flexible religion. Paramacharya used to give this example of when you come and land in a airport, there are so many people waiting to take you to your home. Different transport. You can get an auto rickshaw, you can get a car, you can get a limo, you can get a bus, you can get uh, whatever transport is available. But they all take you to the same destination, your home. They may take different paths. They may give you different levels of comfort. But eventually, the goal is one, that's home, that is moksha. So that is providing the many paths. So we are coming to the, the last slide of this day today. These ancient values, the India never ever invaded another country. On the contrary, the values of Sanatana Dharma have reached many countries. They have, they have gone across the entire world. If you see, there are, even in Vietnam, I saw a temple. So these have reached corners of the globe, including the United States. Thanks to Swami Vivekananda, who brought it to this country for the first time. Until then, they did not know much about Sanatana Dharma or Hinduism. But today you find it, it is reaching everywhere. Now, the ancient values that were ingrained in Sanatana Dharma are now serving as essential common thread to link Hindus all around the globe. Now, what are these values? One, of course, is basic spirituality. Hindus in general are spiritual persons, though they may not exhibit. But you see how many people go to temples and have at least a portrait of some god in their home, which they pray every day. You see these women praying. They are praying outside a tree and where they have a little idol and then they keep praying. And it is a common sight. It's a common sight. They worship trees. They worship animals. They worship rivers. They worship the five elements. It's all there. When you go and see that, you'll be amazed that see the spirituality prevailing everywhere. And above all, it is very simple. It's simplicity. Not much money is spent. Not a building has to be there. It is within you. And bhakti is a root in Kali Yuga. We did sing one thing. It doesn't cost any money. The rituals are not possible. At least do Namas and Kirtanam. Then the pursuit of truth that goes in. The the this is uh, all Varnas. Uh, the dignity of labor is felt in all Varnas. They have a role to play. There is nothing like superior or inferior in that. And it is very open. But if people get mixed up, it is not the fault of Sanatana Dharma. Somebody is interpreting wrongly or there is some politics involved. So you don't need to uh, really renounce everything. You can be what you are. You see, the religion is as universal tolerance and acceptance. It's open to all paths to pray and worship, not necessarily even part of Hinduism, but even part of others. The nutshell is really, you have to be human. And that is the message conveyed by Sanatana Dharma. You have to be human, not just live for yourself, but live for society. Pursue your goals, but have a blend of dharma and karma. So we did mention about some of these saints who really attained the final phase of Purusharthas without really going through sannyasa. They were family people having ordinary kind of... So that's what makes uh, Hinduism very easy Hinduism. All these variation in belief in supreme being and caring is not outside, but it is within you. 
I said, Jivatma, you are a part of God. Just imagine, you are a part of the Almighty. And therefore, nurturing your own self is itself a bhakti. That itself is a bhakti. That is why we always say the simplicity and acceptance of this Sanatana Dharma is a path to salvation. And it is an easy matter, not really very complicated. So in Tamil, we say, you know, Yemmadamum Sammadame. That means all religions are acceptable. It is so open and so tolerant. And also we say, Sarve Janaga Sukino Bhavantu. Let all people be happy. You know, these are all important messages conveyed by Sanatan Dharma. And that is why this is something which is essential part of what we should follow. So with that, I'd like to conclude this. Uh, you want to sing something? A short bhajan we'll have. As we talked about the Namas. Jai Mataji. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to thank uh, the Chicago Kalibari management and also my good friend. Sri Sampatayanga for having coordinated this program, which is a program, a series of six lectures, each of about one hour duration. So with that, I'd like to conclude this series until we meet again. Namaskarams to all and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, dear devotees. Uh, Professor Subramaniam and uh, Mrs. Vidya Subramaniam did a fantastic teamwork of bringing the nutshells of uh, such a big ocean of Sanatana Dharma. See, they dived deep into the sea and brought out the valuable, you know, the uh, pearls, you know, from there. And in the six hours, uh, they <coughs> uh, gave it to us, you know, all the salient features of the Sanatana Dharma. I see that one very well explained, but such a complicated subject also. And we thank them profusely for that, uh, that one. And uh, please come again, you know, with another topic, we will do it. Again, uh, Professor Subramaniam will be doing his, um, the other lecture on the glories of uh, uh, Ma. Uh, I think a couple of lectures to go on that subject uh, that we will be meeting next uh, Saturday on that, you know. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.